When talking about the effects of nuclear bombs and nuclear weapons exchange in general, the media usually paints a simplified and very defeatist picture. If there is a nuclear war, everyone will die. Well, no, not everyone will die. Even if you happen to live in a big city and even if your city gets targeted and nukes start exploding around, you might still have a decent chance of surviving the immediate blast, depending on certain factors. This video will try to show how a nuclear blast kills and what can affect its lethality in a city. Before we learn about nuke effects in urban settings, here's an opportunity to learn about an almost nuclear war, the Yom Kippur War. This video sponsor, Sagar, is all about it. It's an interactive war simulator that puts you in the shoes of the supreme commander of the Israeli forces just before the start of the war. Sagar is geared towards intellectuals, who want to learn about the war and discover history in a fun and immersive way. It's committed to historical accuracy. It faithfully presents real events, battles, politics and historical characters. It presents you with decisions the way actual high command would be faced with. In Sagar, you can take part in frontline visits, high generals' gatherings and diplomatic decisions. You can interrogate spies, eavesdrop on enemy communications, analyze battle reports or discover weapons and aircraft. Let me tell you, Sagar's database is both accurate and enormous. You also learn about the art of war, based on the teachings of great generals like Sun Tzu or Clausewitz. There are statistics on morale and supplies present, so you'll learn about logistics too. Your actions can also lead to moments of alternate history. Ultimately, you use all the information presented to you, connect the dots and learn how to become a great general. Try it out yourself at sagar.com or just follow the link down below in the video description. On with our video. Not all nuclear warheads are the same. The initial ones used on Japan in 1945 had low yields. Yields quickly rose over the next two decades, with some warheads going over 10 megatons. But it was soon realized that greater efficiency could be achieved if a single missile carried multiple warheads, but with a smaller yield. Also due to today's great accuracy, targeting fairly small targets can be achieved with smaller and lighter warheads. Most intercontinental ballistic missiles today carry warheads that are several hundred kilotons in yield. So assuming you live in a country somewhere in Europe or North America, what sort of nuclear warheads could you expect? Let's take the Russian nuclear arsenal as an example. What is shown are long-range missiles, intercontinental ballistic ones and cruise missiles. While there are other tactical warheads too, their short reach means they aren't likely to be used on many cities. Very roughly speaking, Russian strategic arsenal warheads range from 100 to 800 kilotons in yield. Taking all those warheads and their yields into account, one can see that the average yield of those warheads is some 258 kilotons. But smaller warheads would likely be somewhat more commonly expended on military and industrial targets, smaller in area. And submarine-launched missiles, which generally have smaller warheads, would be available in smaller numbers due to submarine maintenance cycles. So the average warhead that is likely to be used on big population centers is going to be a 400 or 500 kiloton one. This video is thus going to model all the damage effects after a 450 kiloton warhead. One might wonder if Russia has the ability to fire off 3500 warheads, wouldn't it spend most of those on enemy cities? The answer is, it would not. Attacking cities but not military targets would expose the attacker to the risk of its own military being demolished by enemy retaliation. And however devastated a country might be, even if half the population is killed, it could still cause problems. The surviving population, if it had functioning military and industrial sites, could retaliate. Which is why the two big nuclear powers plan to use most of their strategic nukes on military and government targets, and out of remaining targets, roughly half would be again be spent on various crucial industrial, economic and infrastructure targets. A British Ministry of Defense study from the 1970s concluded that an actual ratio of targets within the UK would be as follows. It would not be implausible that an attacker today would use roughly 65% of its warheads on more dense target sets like military bases, and they would use smaller warheads on those. So what would a nuke blast do to a city? 
The explosion itself creates a fireball that is fairly small compared to the reach of other effects. The air pressure blast crushes the buildings and pushes everything away. The farther you are from the detonation, the pressure will be smaller. That really applies to all the other effects too. There is a direct radiation that's emitted from the detonation. It lasts only for a moment, but it can be deadly when one is directly exposed to it near the blast. 450 rem dose from the blast will usually cause such radiation damage that 50% of people exposed to it will die within a month. Finally, there is heat or thermal radiation. If directly exposed to its rays, it can be deadly even at considerable distances. If third degree burns cover half the surface area of a person, that person will likely die. Plus heat rays can set various materials alight, potentially causing uncontrolled fires. If detonation happens lower near the ground, there will be more direct nuclear fallout, as the irradiated soil is thrown into the air. But ground features and buildings will provide a shield so other effects will be much less lethal at greater distances. Thus most nukes today would likely detonate higher up in the air. Such high up detonations are more dangerous, as more people and buildings will be directly exposed to radiation, heat and the blast wave. But here's the thing. All the figures so far were given for effects on a single unshielded target at a given distance. But just standing behind the structure can greatly shield a person from said threats. Or one building can be somewhat shielded if behind another bigger building. This image shows the effects of shielding. A building made of concrete was tested in a nuclear blast. It withstood 5 psi pressure. Directly shielded by it was a gas tank that did not suffer significant damage. Basically, if a building doesn't collapse immediately, it will help shield buildings behind it. In city environments, with many large buildings densely arranged, the urban dwellings will lower the actual effects of a nuclear blast several fold. Mind you, due to airburst altitude, which for a 450 kiloton warhead might be even a mile up, many buildings will, for the most part, still get directly exposed to the effects. It's plausible that in a city with buildings 9 stories tall, said buildings would shield some 50% of the exposed area of the buildings behind them at around 3 or so miles from the epicenter. Still, even the very building you're in can offer quite a bit of protection. Nuke blast simulation studies have shown that casualties inside dwellings are around 90% lower than when people are simply standing out in the open, providing the building doesn't collapse. Of course, to actually shelter before a nuclear blast, one would have to know there is going to be a nuclear attack. The military would need to detect missile plumes, interpret results, perhaps get confirmation and precise tracking by radars, and then send out warnings to the general population. During the Cold War, the British maintained they could offer four minutes of warning to their population. Today, due to better sensors and automation, that might be a few minutes better. And the US population, due to physical distance, might enjoy even 10 or so minutes of warning. But it would still be absolute chaos. Everyone would be trying to shelter in any sort of a nearby sturdy building possible. Many would be fleeing underground, which would generally be a smart decision. Without the line of sight to the explosion, sheltered in the middle of a reinforced concrete building, or even underground, people could have much better chances of survival from many aspects of the blast. In Hiroshima 1945, there were examples of people hiding in reinforced concrete buildings that withstood some 23 psi of pressure, and surviving. For a 450 kiloton warhead, that would equate to some 1.2 miles away from the ground zero, though the angle of the blast wave hitting the buildings might be less favorable than one in 1945. Due to the low yield and fairly high airburst altitude, those few concrete buildings in Japan received a good portion of the blast wave from above, which such buildings can generally tolerate better. Hiding in the basement or an underground garage would be a good choice. That way the chance for any sort of radiation leaking through, including thermal, would be significantly lessened. Metro station and tunnels would be an even better choice. They are usually buried several stories into the ground, with narrow stairways and hallways. A study was made for the Washington DC subway stations and the result was that the stations themselves would survive without collapsing in an overpressure of up to 100 psi. Such massive overpressure even for the 450 kiloton bomb 
would be felt only out to half a mile away from the epicenter. Of course, people inside the subway station would still not survive just half a mile away, as a lot of the blast wave would spill through the subway entrances. The same study concluded that the Washington DC station themselves, since they're lacking blast resistant doors, offer protection to humans up to overpressure of some 30 to 40 psi, which translates to roughly 9 tenths of a mile from the ground zero. Incidentally, there are some cities which do feature blast doors inside some of their metro networks, but they're mostly located in China and the ex-Soviet Union. So most people would likely get at least enough warning to shield themselves from direct exposure, which means radiation rays at the moment of the blast. That also means fewer burns, as long as everything around people doesn't catch fire. Which is why underground dwellings are again a good choice. They generally have less combustible stuff. Being in a room with bare concrete walls is much safer than being in a furnished room that could turn into a fiery inferno. But there are secondary effects of the nuclear blast that might still be quite destructive to a city. Thermal radiation would, as said, set stuff afire. Buildings, vegetation in parks and so on. It would be a very unperfect ring of fire around the epicenter. Too close to the bomb, the blast itself would not support the fire. Too far away from the blast, there would not be enough heat to set alight enough material. Plus, the buildings would offer patches of shelters from high temperatures, even quite close to the blast center. Let's analyze this image. It's based on a study where San Francisco was modeled to suffer a 10 kiloton nuke detonating 300 meters in the air. Red areas show super high temperatures. Yellow areas suffer enough heat exposure that thin paper might catch fire. Green areas denote fairly low temperatures, where even second degree burns are unlikely. One can notice that there are dark blue areas, devoid of any heat threat, even very, very close to the epicenter, due to buildings shielding certain areas of the city. But it has to be repeated that's a low altitude 10 kiloton blast. A 450 kiloton blast, occurring 4 to 5 times higher, would cause fewer such dark blue areas. Still, in any large city with many large buildings, a considerable portion of the city that would otherwise be within the heat threat perimeter would be in fact safe from heat. Still, some fires would be inevitable. And depending on just how many warheads a city receives and how close those warhead detonations are to each other, a massive firestorm could form. If that manages to happen, it would be much harder for the city's residents to survive inside the area covered by a firestorm. Generally, for an urban firestorm to form, it is thought that 50% of dwellings in an area have to burn at the same time, and that the fuel fire load, or load of flammable materials, has to be of a certain level, 8 pounds per square foot. We also have actual World War II examples. The Allies had dropped so many incendiary bombs on certain German and Japanese cities in World War II that they created the same effect. A firestorm also formed in Hiroshima, as its fire load was sufficient. German cities that were firebombed conventionally contained far more flammable materials per area. Data on today's cities is not clear, but a Swiss study from the 1960s suggests fuel loads in Swiss cities might not be high enough to allow firestorms to form. There are also sporadic studies from the US, suggesting many of its cities have roughly half of the fuel load required. Due to the much larger areas and smaller density of US cities on average, it's not really surprising that most US cities would fare better in that regard. But firestorm events are very hard to model and predict. There are conflicting studies on the likelihood of such firestorms developing. In theory, more warheads detonating within a tight urban area with enough of a fuel load might mean individual fires might multiply so much that they heat up enormous amounts of air. That heated air can then escape upwards, while the cooler air outside of the fire area gets sucked in. A sort of a natural pump system is created. And the moving heated air would really be equivalent to superheated hurricane winds. The fire could intensify beyond any normal fire and burn down nearly everything. Even people in basements would be in great danger. All that could develop within half an hour, but possibly within as little as 10 minutes after the attack. A city which suffers dozens of blasts to a fairly small area 
might thus suffer such firestorms out to 5 or so miles away from the center of the blasts. Weather can influence the distance at which such fires can be created, however. Rain, haze, smoke, they can all absorb some of the thermal radiation of the blast. While the initial figure was given for a clear day, a gloomy rainy day cutting the visibility in half would shrink the firestorm radius to some 3.5 miles from the epicenter. Exact conditions for firestorms, however, would vary greatly. It's likely that cities receiving just one bomb or even a few bombs fairly spread out from one another would not face such fire destruction. But key cities like London, Paris or New York with high fuel load figures might indeed be likely to receive so many nukes in a fairly small area that the firestorms might be unavoidable. So in such cities the residents might face a deadly predicament. After the warheads detonate, should they remain sheltered in place? Or should they try to use the 10 to 15 minute window to somehow escape the fires until radiating particles of the nuclear fallout start settling in from the atmosphere? There is no easy answer there, as the fallout particles are also very dangerous once they fall on people. For example, if they get stuck on one's skin, clothes and so on. And it's usually recommended that people do not leave their shelters for at least 48 hours after the blast, until those particles lose much of their radiation potency. Wind direction would be crucial too, as knowing where the wind blows might help survivors evade almost all of the most dangerous fallout. Finally, there is the electromagnetic pulse affecting the city. Electrical installations and electronics might suffer but such widespread effects have not been tested and are hard to predict. For example, cell phones and various other small form electronics without large antennas or cables are less likely to get hurt. Also, air density greatly influences EMP propagation. So a nuke going off a mile off the ground is not going to be comparable to one going off high in the atmosphere. EMP effects from a 450 kiloton nuke in a city may propagate a dozen or two miles away from ground zero to various effects. All in all, a city after a single such nuke would be quite devastated. Not only would a lot of buildings get wrecked, but chances are important buildings would be among those. Hospitals, fire stations and so on. It's very likely most people would be on their own, immediately following a nuke blast, without access to medical attention. Various US agencies estimated that even if a single terrorist activated nuclear device went off in one US city, it would take at least a day before significant federal help would start arriving. In a scenario where hundreds of cities might be hit, meaningful federal help might not be available for much longer, if it ever comes. Still, given everything shown in the video, nuke blasts can be survived given certain circumstances. The question is, what then? Would one want to fight for their lives from then on? Through years of a decaying society, lawlessness, hunger, diseases and possibly even further wars for remaining resources? Good luck to us all if it really happens. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.